In Ephesians 5, verse 21, it reads very simply, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the time and the opportunity to come together like this. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for the gift of your word, the privilege of being able to come and to open it and to hear it and to be emboldened and empowered and freed by it. Thank you for the power to obey it. And I pray that um, you can use me this morning to communicate what your spirit wants uh, every heart in this room to hear. I pray that you can give those who are listening um, ears that will hear, humble hearts that will receive God. We pray that ultimately you are glorified and exalted, that everyone who's listening can be transformed and edified, God. And I pray that we can get closer and closer to you. We love you so much. We thank you for this time. In your son Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen. 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 Good morning. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much for coming and being here. I know I say this all the time, but I, I, I need to repeat it because we live in a society that is so saturated with church and so saturated with uh, you know, if you go down the street, there's at least 12 churches from between here and the actual city of Columbia. Uh, you can go anywhere. You could be anywhere. You could sit in your pajamas and be online and not have to fellowship at all and just nod your head and enjoy the fact that church is everywhere. But that's not what we're trying to be, right? We're not trying to be a virtual experience. So if you have to be home, amen, I, I appreciate the fact that you are tuning in. But we're trying to be something different, something countercultural, something that can only be found in the scriptures and can only be found in people who are actually filled with the Holy Spirit and redesigned to transform the world around us. So if you're here this morning, joining us. We are very grateful, and our prayer is that you come join the family. Help us with this supernatural task of living out the kingdom of God and bringing that kingdom to the world around us. Amen? Uh, I've had a few conversations in the last several weeks, and it has come to my attention that apparently I can seem relatively intense from the pulpit. Apparently. Um, somebody said that's not true. Amen. I, I agree with you. Uh, no, l listen, I just, I, I want to say this. Um, and especially for those of you uh, who are visiting, like I, I, I understand, you know, it's your, it might be your first time coming and then you, you come and I'm like, you know, exploding up here uh, from the pulpit. Um, one, I, I just want to say I am a faulty person. I got all kinds of issues. And one of the biggest issues I have is, you know, just there's a scripture in Philippians that says, let your gentleness be evident to all, right? And um, I, I, I try to keep that in mind. That's a character issue uh, I'm, I'm always trying to work on. And, and sometimes it, I can be gentle up here. Most of the time it doesn't seem like I'm gentle from up here, but I think we have to, you know, sometimes define what gentleness is. Even, e anyways. I just want to apologize if it is ever my lack of Christ-likeness that's distracting you from up here. I just want to say that, all right? I don't want to, it, it would be easy for me to say it's the word of God. I, I don't care what, how I say it, you just listen to it. It would be easy for me to say that, but I am faulty. So if it is a part of my character that's distracting you, I apologize. Uh, but but I, I, I also want to say that as you are opening the scriptures, as you are engaging the scriptures, um, don't let anything distract you, though, from the truth and the power of what is coming out. Um, and I also want to say, if it seems I am severe or animated or... It might even seem like I'm angry sometimes. I'm not angry at any of you. But 
going back to the beginning of this sermon series, we, we are engaged, all of us, whether we like it or not, in a serious, severe conflict that is actually and actively destroying lives, families, and marriages. And as much as I would like to preach flowers and sunshine, like, we, the Bible is serious. You know, there's a scripture that talks about when you, when you, when you speak, you know, speak like you're speaking the, the very words of God. And I, and I, 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 what I want us to understand is that like when we come and the Bible is opened, what you're going to experience, what we want to experience a lot of times is the peace of God. But when you hear the word of God, when you encounter the word of God, what you're going to experience is the power of God. The peace doesn't come unless you obey the word you hear. And as much as I, 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 I want us to feel the peace of God, but, but I have to then be very clear and sometimes animated, excited, sometimes uh, indignant about preaching the word clearly. So if I get caught up in the emotion of it all, I just want to implore you all, just try to hear what the Spirit is saying, right? Don't let my, uh, you know, distract you. I, I wanted to say that uh, before we get into it, because again, I, I can understand how, it, how intense it can be, and, but, but that's, that's just it. The Word is intense. And there's a lot of Christians out there, a lot of churches out there, there's a whole side of Christianity that wants to ignore that. That wants to act like, no, we're here. God exists to make me feel happy. I'm like, no. God has come so that we can be transformed. So that we can be freed from the powers of this dark world that are trying very hard to destroy what is good about our lives. So I just, I want to say that before we moved on. Um, again, amen. Welcome. This morning is... Uh, part two of us breaking down the schemes of the homewrecker demon, right, in this Dominion series. A few weeks ago, we started to talk about what marriage was supposed to be and how the homewrecker strikes at the foundation of family by trying to redefine marriage and to be, uh, sorry, to be something else. Um, and I, I want to say this too, um, this sermon today, if you thought the last sermon was intense, I will preface. Uh, this one was the intended gut punch, if you will. All right. Last time was the intro. and Y'all were like, yo, that was intense. I was like, oh, no. Uh, <laughs> you all just wait. So I will say this. This is a monstrous sermon. Uh, in content, uh, honestly, I think in length, I'm going to, I'm going to try, I always try to be good, to do right by you guys. Um, but this demon is so pervasive and so overwhelming in our culture that I, I want to be, I want to make sure we do our due diligence in addressing how he is trying to destroy us in our families. Uh, and even though this is a monstrous sermon, we're talking about monsters. And, you know, uh, oftentimes we just need a sword big enough to crush the monsters that are facing us. So that's what this sermon is, is, is going to be. Um, you know, last time I, I, uh, I ended on this whole note of talking about, like, one of the thing that the home record, things that the home record does is he attacks the definition of marriage. And I talked about homosexuality, same-sex marriage, and that kind of stuff. And I want to say that the home record schemes don't just stop there at redefining what marriage is, right? Let's say that we do get the fundamental definition down, okay? Let's say that we understand that marriage is a union between a man and a woman. Uh, there are still plenty of other places uh, in a marriage that we need to make sure are glorifying God, there are other places in our marriage that the homewrecker is going to seek to destroy. And I think sometimes, guys, you know, I think at the end of that sermon, you know, we're in such a culture where same-sex marriage and homosexuality, it's so championed. It's, it's, it's so 
uh, like the, the world and the culture loves it. They exalt it. And I think sometimes we can feel very defensive, very adamant, like, no, 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 we need to stand on the truth. But I think sometimes many of us can be so adamant about whether gay marriage is legal or not, all the while we ourselves in our own marriages are missing every other aspect of a godly marriage. Like, how much sense does it make to stand on politics and be all against gay marriage when you go home and are an awful spouse? Right? Woe to people who think in such ways. I, I, I tell you the truth. It'll be better on the day of judgment for gay marriages who rejected the definition of marriage but tried to embrace, at the very least, behaving like Jesus in that false marriage than it will be for some of us heterosexual couples who land-based same-sex civil unions and yet entirely reject every other aspect of godliness in our own marriage. Beyond the basic definition, today we're going to continue to talk about what a sacred marriage is supposed to be like. This is Dominion 7, the homewrecker part 2 the spirit-centered marriage. We're going all the way back to Genesis. Those few definitions we gave to Genesis in the last sermon, we're going to go right back through. Last time we applied them to the man, we applied them to the woman. This morning we're going to apply them to what marriage is supposed to be. Genesis 7, uh, sorry, Genesis 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. This goes for the man, this goes for the woman, but this goes for the marriage as well. A marriage must be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to be what fills and animates a marriage. You see, most of the world's marriages miss this mark. And here's the deal. If you're not a Christian, if you haven't made Jesus Lord, then technically none of the other points I'm going to talk about this morning can even apply to you because you will not have the power to consistently do what comes next. Now, it is possible for people to not know Jesus and not have the Holy Spirit, but like understand and see the wisdom in the ways of God, even though they might not know it's the ways of God. So, at the end of the day, if you do what Jesus tells you to do, you're going to reap the benefits of that obedience. Even if you didn't know that Jesus told you to do it. Am I making sense? So if like, you didn't grow up in the Christianity, but you learned to be humble and to respect your spouse, that is going to bear fruit in your marriage. And it's going to bring about good and godly fruit, even though you might not know what the source of that goodness is. But... When it comes to us Christians who know what the truth is and know what we're doing, this means that the first and greatest priority for the Christian is to marry another Christian. All right? Like, this is super important. And I don't just mean to marry someone that gives lip service and says, I believe, or, you know, I had a salvation experience one time. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about marrying somebody who has committed their life to the lordship of Jesus and received the Holy Spirit at their baptism, not just in word or in tongue, but in actions and in truth. This means, church, that just because somebody is a part of the fellowship that we're a part of doesn't mean they're living out what they say they believe. That means that even within the fellowship, not everybody is a candidate for marriage. Not everybody is a candidate for dating. We have to be wise about who we are pursuing, about who we are deciding to commit our lives to. And just because we have the same quote-unquote beliefs, that's the, the, the same beliefs is just the first step. Are we actually practicing those beliefs? And for many of us, we don't, we stop at the, just the same beliefs. Well, well, she believes the right stuff or he believes the right stuff. No, listen, it can get really bad if they're not committed to living the right things. <laughs> Some of you are like, listen, Perry, I'm already married. Like that ship has already sailed and we are where we are. And we're going to get to that whole section 
But for those of you who aren't yet, just keep in mind, being a part of the same church is just simply not enough. We all have to be serious about working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And we can be so obsessed with getting to that marriage part that we're just overlooking all kinds of stuff. We'll get to that. But just like, like Damien Jean-Baptiste told me one time, I said, how do you know if a girl is the one? He said, Perry, that's not a thing. Find the most spiritual girl you can and marry her. But that means for me, I need to be as spiritual as I can be as well. Because how ridiculous would it be if I was reaching for somebody spiritual, but I myself was going to do her a disservice? Let's just keep that in mind. All right. That's the first priority. Marry a Christian. Second greatest priority in a marriage is that both partners labor and strive to always follow the Holy Spirit. The home wrecker strikes this area of our lives very intentionally. Many of us think we're going to be good spouses without the power of the Holy Spirit. Many of us think we're good people already without submitting ourselves to Jesus. Listen to this, church. Without submitting yourself to the Holy Spirit, you are not able to do anything. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. Okay? Your sinful nature, without the Holy Spirit, your sinful nature will claim dominion over you and over your marriage, and you'll find yourself being married to the worst versions of yourselves. Now, I'm going to get more into this, but hear me out. Many of us miss this fact. When you get married, you make certain vows. And you say this thing, and, and, and the thing that you say is, for better or for worse. And yet, when the worst comes, we got the audacity to act like, we ain't, I ain't signed up for this. <laughs> it's like, well, actually, you did. Actually, you vowed before your family and God that even if this person becomes the worst version of themselves, you will stay and fight it out. I'm just telling you what your vows were. That's all I'm saying, okay? We'll get more into that. But when you're not following the Holy Spirit, that worst version is what comes out. And yet there are couples in this church who don't practice the spiritual disciplines. There are people listening to this sermon right now who are so self-righteous they think just because the Holy Spirit lives in them that everything they do or say must be spiritual and right. And I guarantee you, if that's your attitude, you will spiritually write yourself all the way down to the wrong place. And many of you are already there. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you're filled with some other spirit. If your marriage isn't filled with the Holy Spirit, it's filled with some other spirit. If only one of you is following the Holy Spirit and the other is not, the marriage becomes both a victory and a tragedy because the one following the Spirit will inevitably behave like Jesus, enduring all the scorn, whips, lashes, and crucifixions wrought on them by the spouse who does not follow the Spirit. And the home wrecker will sit in the corner laughing about that dynamic the whole time. Let's say you both don't follow the Holy Spirit. What will happen is you'll crucify each other and the home wrecker will sit in the corner laughing about that dynamic the whole time, achieving exactly what he wanted to achieve. But if both people follow the Holy Spirit, then both will be like Jesus. And the only thing Jesus ever crucified was sin. People who follow the Holy Spirit are more concerned with crucifying their own sinful nature than they are with defeating their spouses. They become people who can see the home record clearly and fight to destroy it rather than each other. 
Following the Spirit means you win even if you lose because you have been faithful to the kind of marriage that brings glory to the God of heaven. So the question becomes then, how to be a person who surrenders to the Spirit of God? How do we become those kinds of people? And this goes back to the, to the typical Perry sermon. Read your Bible. Meditate on the Word of God. Memorize the Scriptures. Obey the Scriptures. Guys, it's super simple, yet some of us do not open our Bibles on a consistent basis. I will never not tell you guys to read your Bible. However redundant it is, like, it would be crazy, right, that like at a health club or something at a gym, the people would have to consistently tell their members to eat. It's like, I shouldn't have to tell us to eat, but I have to tell us to eat because there are so many other things. Well, no, it's not that I have to tell you to eat. I have to tell you to eat healthy food because a lot of us are consuming all kinds of stuff. But what we need to consume is the word of God. So I'm going I'm to fly through these. You guys know the spiritual disciplines. Uh, constantly wash your mind and your heart with the word of God. Pray always, fast continuously, Sabbath, practice silence and solitude. Guys, practice the spiritual disciplines. Do these things often. Do them all the time. Do them every day. Do them multiple times a day. Submerge yourself in the, in the motions and the rhythms of how Jesus lived his life, guys. These are necessary. This is, we, it, we're not um, the book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. It says if you're too busy to do these things, you're too busy to be a Christian. Okay? We have to do these things. Now, how do you know if you are surrendering to the word of God? Because those things are a means to an end. Because you read your Bible doesn't mean you follow the Holy Spirit. All of these things, reading, praying, fasting, Sabbathing, silence and solitude, they are things that are making you sensitive to following the Spirit. But you still have to choose and decide to follow the Spirit. And you know you're surrendering to the Spirit if your character is becoming more like Jesus. So if you're doing these things and you're not becoming more like Jesus, you got to switch something up. You in the gym wasting your time, not getting any gains. And honestly, uh, when you work out inconsistently or poorly, what happens is you get no gains or you injure yourself. We can't be like that spirit. So we have to do these things. Um, uh, he talks about in, in Timothy uh, 2. Uh, he says, watch your life and doctrine closely. And he, he says to persevere in them, right? That there's this constant connection between the, 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 the practices that you're doing and the life that comes out of those practices, okay? It's, it's, it's very closely intertwined. And it says, persevere in them so that you can become more and more like Jesus. What the scripture actually says is so that you can save both yourself and those who observe your life and hear your word. What's important to note and integral to this message is that the things that come next, that I'm going to talk about next, are all a result of following the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, doing the next things will be extremely difficult to accomplish and impossible to maintain over a long period of time. So the prerequisite is that you do the work and submit yourselves, be individuals who submit yourselves to the Holy Spirit. Next, a sacred marriage should be guided by obedience to the scriptures, okay? Genesis 2, 16, and the Lord God commanded the man. He gave a commandment. We're supposed to submit ourselves to the scriptures, all right? This is in both the confines of the marriage as in the husband and wife towards each other, and it's for the marriage as a whole, as in the couple going out into the world and executing God's will together. But first, let's talk about the couple towards each other. What does the Bible say about how husbands and wives should treat each other? I don't have time to preach every one of the scriptures I'm about to read, but I'll read them, and, 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 and I want you to just listen to what the, word, what the scriptures say and ask yourself, is this what my marriage looks like? Okay? Because as Christians, if we're submitted to the Holy Spirit, 
These scriptures should define our marriages. All right. Ephesians 5. We're going to start in verse 21. I started here. I started the sermon here. We're going to just, we're going to read the Bible. Verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the Lord is the head of Sorry, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. That could be scary, because you're like, well, what if my husband is awful? But that's why we keep reading the Bible, right? This scripture is not scary if the husbands then do what comes next. Husbands, guess what? Love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. That's crazy. He says this scary thing like, wives, you got to you gotta rely, you got to submit to your husbands. And that's scary. And then, the, and then he's like, husbands, give up your lives for your wife. That'll make it a lot easier for your wife to submit to you. When you become a person who is giving up your own life to wash her and make her holy and present her perfect in the word. Verse 27, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Colossians 3, 19, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 2. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. That doesn't just apply to a wife with an unbelieving husband. It applies the other way around, too. If you're a husband with an unbelieving wife, this idea that you can save your spouse by exemplifying the goodness, love, and character of Christ. That is crazy. The problem is, many of us never get there. You know, when our spouses are jacked up, it goads us into unspirituality. And we think we have to contend with our spouses and we throw the goodness of Jesus out of the window, thinking we're going to defeat our spouse's sin by fighting it. It sounds crazy, but we defeat our spouse's sin by being humble and honestly, like Jesus did, letting ourselves be crucified. This is a hard teaching, we get more into that. First Peter 3, 7, husbands in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. We're going to talk more about that uh, in, in another point. But I just want to say this. Take these scriptures, write them down, memorize them. Every married couple should take these scriptures and read them every morning and every night and before and after every argument. Like, I'm dead serious. You will think twice. You know, you, you, you get in your argument in your mind. You're like, all right, I'm about to go. I'm about to confront my spouse, my wife, or my husband. You know, you're getting all the, all the defenses together, all the offenses together. But before you go into that room, just stop, pray, read this scripture. I guarantee it will reshape everything you're about to say. But let's say you go in. And as your, as your emotions get involved, you know, that scripture kind of just gets buried further and further in the back of your mind. Come back to it right after, the, right after the argument. I guarantee you'll come back and apologize. I don't care if you were right or wrong. The problem is 
Our communication with each other is so devoid of the scriptures. There's something that just pops out in D times that we have later when we knew all along we were wrong. Or maybe we didn't, but we were too humble to even consider that we could be. These scriptures have to be the rock upon it, it should be the rock upon which we build everything that we do in our marriages. The home wrecker wins when we fail to live out these scriptures. And, and, I, and I, I, I do want to mention this, okay? Um, I want to say a quick note about counseling and therapy because it's very, very popular nowadays. One, let me start off by saying I believe that the home wrecker is so pervasive and dangerous that I want to encourage everybody to make your marriage a team effort. What I mean by that is, don't ever do anything just between the two of you. Like, have many advisors and spiritual people in your lives to help you deal with your issues, all right? Don't think that you're going to overcome your issues in the privacy of your own. So, so in saying that, I'm a complete supporter of therapy, of counseling. I'm a supporter of adding every single thing you can add to make sure you're doing everything in your power to help your marriage to be glorifying to God, okay? So nothing I'm saying, I, I, don't, I, I don't, I am for all of that. And I believe that, uh, that you should do everything. But uh, for a lot of times, well, there's a difference between, I think, counseling and therapy, okay? Counseling, I would say that that, can ha that should be happening even within the confines of your small groups, of your house churches. Like, that's what discipling is, okay? You need to have people in your life talking through with you your life and your issues and your sinful nature and all of that stuff. You just need a bunch of counseling. If you want to pay money for it, go ahead. I mean, if you got that money, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but I would say don't neglect the church, though. Like, the point is that we are all a resource for each other. So, so, so I think first, before you go and spend your money, like God is trying to provide for you all kinds of relationships here that can sit with you and, and help you with these things. Honestly, though, some of us are just super prideful. And like, literally, we have the thought, well, nobody in the church can really handle my issues. It's like, if that's the case, a counselor can't handle it either. Like, you need Jesus, and you need to humble out. Um, two, there's another situation where maybe there's some, like, mental illness involved, okay? Maybe there's just some incapacity there. Um, and that's where, you know, that's where real, like, therapy, medicine, and those things come in. And again, I'm going to encourage, do everything you can to figure out how to be like Jesus. But when it comes to counseling a lot of times, and when it comes to therapy— I, I think the, the biggest thing that happens is what that stuff is going to do, it's going it's to, one, help you understand why you behave the way you behave. And two, it's going to primarily give you good communication tools so that you don't destroy each other as you're trying to figure out how to work through stuff. That's, that, that's primarily what happens in therapy and in counseling. But I do want to say this, though, because a lot of times we use those things as excuses for why we aren't spiritual. And we'll have the attitude, well, I can't get spiritual or I can't do the right thing until I go do this, until I go get counseling. But that's just not true. Like, you don't actually need to know why you act sinful. You just need to repent and stop acting sinful. Now, figuring out why it's happening is very helpful, right? But just because you know why don't mean you're going to stop acting sinful, Right? And how ridiculous is it? You go to counseling, you're like, oh, you know, I curse at you whenever I get mad because my parents used to curse at me. It's like, okay, good. So the next time you get mad, you know, you curse. And it's like, well, I, I, thought, you, I thought we went to counseling. You're like, well, I mean, well, that's why I cursed at you again because my parents used to curse at me. And it's like, no, 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 that's <laughs> the point is transformation. Right? And if you're not humble to the scriptures, if you're not humble to discipling, what makes you think you're going to hum be humble to the paid professional? Some of us just need to repent. And if you have all those resources and you can get all psychoanalytical, amen. 
But I think we trust these outside sources more sometimes than we trust the actual word of God. And honestly, a therapist ain't going to tell you nothing that those few scriptures I just read are going to tell you. Say what? Wow. He said many marriage professionals have already been divorced at least once or twice. We got to really be mindful of who we're getting our advice from. That's crazy. But just think about this, guys. I think sometimes uh, we can have the idea. Sometimes we can trust these professionals more than we trust the word of God. Uh, the truth is therapy is good, but the Bible is necessary. But many of us think that the Bible is good, but therapy is necessary. And I would say we just need to switch that in our minds. Sometimes we have to get to therapy because we're simply not practicing the spiritual disciplines. Like we're just simply not spiritual. And so we go to worldly or even spiritual counselors to tell us that we need to follow the Bible. You could have just read the Bible. I mean, I, look, again, I'm not saying don't do it. But I'm saying your trust needs to be in obeying the word of God. The scriptures have to be what we are leaning on. All right, but when the spouses are obeying the scriptures towards each other, they have to also do it as a couple out in the community. So the very next point, the sacred marriage should have the goal of taking care of God's shalom, right? Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man out and put him in the garden to work it and to take care of it. This means that a sacred marriage should have the mission of the church in mind, right? A godly marriage should be involved in the missional efforts of the congregation. A godly marriage should serve the congregation in laboring and striving to present everyone perfect in Christ. A godly marriage should be focused on using that marriage to go and to make disciples of all nations, to be using that marriage to help baptize people and teach them to obey everything, to help rescue people from the darkness that is in the world. A godly marriage should be a river of life that serves and loves the community wherever they are. You know, I mentioned this idea last time and it sounded harsh, but I said a lot of times we get married and, and, and we can become black holes or blemishes on the congregation. It's because if we are selfish and not missionally minded as individuals, and then we marry somebody that's of a like mind, then our marriage will be selfish and not missionally minded. And we will be people who do not serve or who, who are not rivers of life, who don't make a difference wherever we are. We're not helping anybody else become Christians. And oftentimes, because we're a black hole and we're just kind of staying to ourselves, we become the worst versions of ourselves. Like we're not doing the work in any direction. And so we, we, all we can do is implode. And, and I'm not saying that to rebuke anybody. What I'm trying to do is just express and explain what God intends for our marriages to be. Like this is what you are signing up for when you make those vows. When you decide I'm going to enter into this union that is supposed to show the world who God is through the ways that we love each other. Does your marriage have the goal of taking care of God's shalom? Next, a godly marriage should avoid the knowledge of evil. Genesis 2, 17, but you must not eat from the true, uh, sorry, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. I think this can be confusing because uh, Adam and Eve already ate the fruit and in our world, the knowledge of evil is already rampant, right? I think, but this commandment is about trusting the good that God has given you and not pursuing the things God did not give you. That means the immediate practical is to not pursue the forbidden fruit of adultery. Like there is a, there, there's a nonsensical evil in this world that says when you fall out of love with your spouse, it's time to move on. Like literally, some people believe that not feeling the butterflies anymore is a valid reason to divorce your wife or husband. Understand this. Love is not a feeling. It's an action. 
It is a commitment. You're going to feel all kinds of ways about your spouse all throughout your life, but you made a commitment. Evil is best described not in its action, but in its result. The aftermath of adultery is a primary example of the fruit of evil. It's heartbreak. It's grief. It's the feeling of being betrayed, being made a fool of, having broken trust and shame, and we can feel ridiculed. The home wrecker wins when we choose to be unfaithful to our spouse. You know, I think we can desire the knowledge of evil. Uh, what I'm trying to say is this. I think because the world tells us it's okay, we will do all kinds of stuff. When we don't let the scriptures shape our minds, we become actually okay with having the thought of, hmm, I'm no longer content in this situation. I want to move on and find something else. But that discontentment is not something that comes from the Spirit of God. Discontentment is never a fruit of the Spirit, right? The fruit of the Spirit is going to help you look at your spouse and say, I don't care how I feel, I made a vow to love this person like I did in those first years where we were just consumed with each other. And regardless of how I feel, I'm going to behave like I did in those first years. It's not about how you feel. It's about the vow that you made. Keeping the marriage bed pure is a great victory over the homewrecker and adultery is oftentimes a killing blow from the beast. So let me get into my last point this morning. Genesis 2, 24 through 25, and the point is this. A sacred marriage practices the unity of God and the Trinity, creating a space that is completely vulnerable, open, and without guilt. Right? Genesis 2, 24 says... Uh, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So marriage should be a gracious space. I'm saying this point right off the heels of talking about unfaithfulness and adultery. Okay? And I mentioned that unfaithfulness and adultery is oftentimes a killing blow to a marriage. That's the home record's real. He gets in there, and, and, and because there are scriptures like, you know, uh, and people debate it all the time, like, are we allowed to get divorced as Christians? I, I don't ever think the, the conversation, though, should be what are we allowed to do. The conversation should always be what would Jesus do? That's what we should be trying to chase. But I get it. The concept of our spouses cheating on us is very, very difficult to wrap our heads around. But the marriage space should be a place that is full of grace, a place that's full of compassion, full of empathy. It should be a place that's full of love that covers over a multitude of sin. It should be a place that causes fear, shame, and guilt to vanish. And this space can only be achieved by defeating the homewrecker in all the above areas. The ultimate goal of marriage, church, listen to this. Write this down if you need to. The ultimate goal of marriage is to replicate the beauty, glory, and fruit of God's love, to teach people about God's character, to help those who are married draw closer to God so that they can be a unit who help other people draw close to God. That is the ultimate goal of marriage. I want to say those things again, but what I want you to do is I want you to think about your marriage. Is this the ultimate goal of your marriage? To replicate the beauty, glory, and fruit of God's love. Think about how you treat your spouse, how you speak to your spouse, how you think of your spouse. 
is does your marriage does your marriage teach people about the character of God? Think about that in how you treat each other. Does your marriage help those who are married draw closer to God so that they can help other people draw closer to God? Do these things define your marriage? And if they don't, why not? What is stopping these things from defining your marriage? I think the answer is very simple. It's because the home wrecker is winning in some of the above areas. And how do you know your marriage is a good example of the sacred marriage? Well, you know because it's a place that achieves the things that I just talked about. And it's also a space where there is no shame or fear because it is so full of grace and compassion and a love that covers over a multitude of sins. So let's talk for a second about divorce. I understand uh, divorce is a big topic. It's a big subject. There's no way I can preach a sermon about this and not talk about it though, right? Divorce is a victory of the homewrecker. But it is not the only way the homewrecker wins. If the demon doesn't get you with divorce, it will fight to make sure your marriage is a living hell devoid of all faithfulness and grace. So there's a difference there, right? There are some of us who are so self-righteous we won't get divorced because we're more fo focused on the image, right? Well, if I get divorced, you know, it'll look bad. So we stay in our marriages, but we don't repent. And so our marriages are awful and ungodly. And we tear each other apart, but we're not going to get divorced. And then there are people who get divorced and they give up altogether. Both, both situations bring no glory to God. The victory is not in staying together. The victory is in repenting from the sins that are destroying your marriage. That's, that's the victory. If you don't repent, it won't matter if you get divorced or not. You don't get any kudos because you kept the civil union. If you were unfaithful to the godly union in your actions, in your speech, in your thoughts about your spouse. Are you guys following me there? Okay. Both situations, the homewrecker wants you to be in one or two of those situations. And as far as divorce goes, this is what I'll say. Divorce is never a fruit of the spirit. I don't care how necessary you think it is for your life. It is not coming from the Spirit of God. Divorce is antithetical to the sacred marriage and to God's intent. How can we be ministers of reconciliation if we cannot even reconcile with the person who's supposed to be most important to us in our lives? What that is, a, that is a wild inverse of the gospel. To say, I, I have the Holy Spirit, God has made me, uh, uh, I'm a part of the kingdom of priests, and we spend all of our time reconciling people with, 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 to God, but we are unwilling to reconcile with our spouses. That's crazy. Now, there are nuances, of course. There are always nuances. But those nuances exist because one or both parties fail to repent. So this goes for both spouses. Your priority should be your own repentance. If, if this is your stance, I'm waiting to be righteous for my spouse to be righteous. Like, until, they're, until they get it right, I'm still going to be unrighteous. That, that can never be the case. We all need to work out our own salvation with fear 
and trembling. And I'm not, this is not a, a sermon this morning. I'm not trying to condemn anybody who's thinking about divorce, who maybe we've gotten divorced. This, I'm not trying to say anything about salvation right now. Um, I think conversations about wh- where you're going when you die, I think those are relatively ridiculous when you're not even recognizing the kind of world you're building here. Okay? So we're all afraid of burning for eternity, but we allow our sinful character traits to burn our marriages and our lives now. You need to be worried about building and being a kingdom person now. We focus so much on on what's coming next that we're, we're unable to see that we actually need to repent and, and live like we're in heaven now. So this is not a deep theological statement about divorce. This is a conversation about repentance. That's what this is a conversation about, about us transforming so that divorce isn't even on the table. So let's say that you're the one who has repented and your spouse makes your marriage awful. Okay, let's say that that's that that's the scenario. Do you then have the right to leave? You you're the godly one. You've repented. You're like Jesus, but your spouse is not. They're awful. They make your marriage awful. They make you miserable. Do you have the right to leave? You do have the right. You have the right to do anything. But if you're following the Spirit, your aim should be Christ-likeness. It should not be escape from difficulty. What I'm about to preach is going to be very hard, church, and I want you to follow me, okay? Your aim should be Christ-likeness, not escape from difficulty. A Christ-like thing to do is... To love that unspiritual spouse like Jesus loves. Extending grace and forgiving sin 70 times 7. Guys, there are some of us that have hard lines in our marriage. If they do this, that's everything, it's called off. If they do this, I'm done. If they do this, I'm out. Some of us, we have those hard lines. Those hard lines aren't biblical. What if God treated us that way? None of us are making it. None of us are making it. Guys, this is forgiving your spouse 70 times 7. Have you guys read the book of Hosea? God says, Hosea, go get a prostitute for a wife. Hosea's like, I don't think that's a good idea. God says, go do it. In the rest of the book, Gomer, his wife, is just, she's just wilding out. She's going to sleep with all kinds of people. Every, and, he, and he says, Hosea, every time she sleeps with somebody else, go buy her back. And love her like I love you. And all his kids, his kids got crazy names like, that ain't mine. Somebody else's. That's Joe's. All his kids, they got names like that. It's crazy. And, 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 and we read the Bible and we read these stories. The entire Old Testament is a story of Israel being an unfaithful spouse. And God is like, I'm mad. I'm not happy about it. I want to destroy y'all. But guess what? I'm going to keep my promise and love you. And we get to the New Testament. You know what he does? He buys us back with his blood. That's crazy. For some reason, we get super worldly about our marriages. And we're like, I will not sacrifice myself and my peace and my happiness because you're refusing to repent. And Jesus is like, well, I was willing to die for you when you were unwilling to repent. Our priority should be Christ's likeness should be forgiving our spouse 70 times 7. This is a hard teaching. This is a painful life. But biblically, guys, listen to this. It is actually a privilege to endure a hard marriage. This is real Christianity, what I'm about to say. Listen to this. Philippians 3, verse 10. This is the moment where we start closing our ears, okay? 
Philippians 3, verse 10. Paul says, I want to know Christ. We're like, yeah, Paul, I do too. He says, yes, to know the power of his resurrection. We're like, yeah, hey, me too. He says, and participate in his sufferings. We're like, wait, Paul. We don't really want to do that now, do we? He says, becoming like him in his death, becoming like Jesus in his death. Have you, have you read the passion account? All of Jesus' skin was ripped off. He had a crown of thorns burrowed into his, into his head. He was beaten and spit on. Paul says, I'm going to become like Jesus in that. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Listen to Hebrews verse 11. Sorry, chapter 11, verse 32. The writer says, and what more shall I say? Listen to the pivot here, okay? Listen to the pivot. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms administered justice and gained what was promised who shut the mouths of lions quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies women received back their dead raised to life again now stop there so the writer is a big paragraph and he's just writing like, man, they did this, and they had this victory, and they had that victory. And so you're the reader, and you're encouraged, and you're like, man, these men were faithful. And that's what faith looks like. Faith looks like getting the victory. But he pivots, and if you're not paying attention, you might not see it. Look here. Right after he talks about these women receive their dead back, raised to life again. This is also faith. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. What is that? You're reading, you're like, victory, victory, faith, 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 faith. There are people who were tortured and did not want to be released. I stop right there. It's the same sentiment that Paul just talked about. I want to be like Jesus. And if, if, if being tortured like I'm being tortured is going to help me understand Jesus' suffering, how much better will it be when I transform and resurrect? Let's keep going. Because the pivot is a hard pivot. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskin, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Following the Holy Spirit, church, means following Jesus even into his suffering. Everybody wants to follow Jesus. Right up until the moment those guards came and started hitting that man. The disciples were like, hey, Jesus, we got your back. We're going to be with you no matter what. The moment he got arrested, they said, wait, I don't think I signed up for this. Some of us are just like those disciples. We run away when things get hard. Why? Because we are unwilling to be crucified. We are unwilling to face the same kind of death that Jesus faced. But you did sign up for this church. The moment you said Jesus is Lord, and honestly, in your marriage, the moment, the moment you said for better or for worse, you did sign up for it. Wanting to escape suffering is natural. Enduring suffering for the sake of Christ is supernatural and only possible through the Holy Spirit. 
There is a nearness to Jesus that only comes through suffering. So how do we do this? How do we stay in a marriage when our spouse refuses to be like Christ and therefore brings upon us endless agony and misery? How do we stay in a situation like that? I've got a few practicals here. First, we have to count the cost before marriage, okay? So many of us, you're like, Barry, we're already married. Well, I understand, but if you're not, just listen to me. Our culture is obsessed with romance and marriage. We are taught from a young age by Hollywood to idolize, fantasize, and ultimately prioritize getting married. Because of that, we will bypass wisdom, advice, growth, and maturity, and spirituality all because romance is our actual goal. And we will make decisions based on achieving that goal rather than decisions centered around being prepared for such a significant commitment. Anyone who endeavors to get married must first count the cost and endeavor to first be Christ-like and second, find a Christ-like partner. If you're not going to do that, and you get married, you're just signing up for a whole bunch of chaos for the rest of your life. And then you put it on us to help you do it. I'm like, just listen to us from the beginning, please. We're not trying to control you. We're trying to help you. <laughs> We're trying to help you. Romance is not a strong enough foundation for something as big as marriage. Let me say that again. Romance is not a strong enough foundation for something as big as marriage. You need a stronger rock, and the only rock strong enough is Christ. Even then, we are fickle, and it's entirely possible to do all the right stuff before you get married and still have a hard marriage, guys. Who knows the kind of people we'll become in five years and 10 years and 20 years. You might have done all this stuff, got all the advice. Okay, so let's say you are married, and you're both Christians, and you're in this thing. This is what most of us really need to hear. Enduring an unfaithful spouse starts with you focusing primarily on your own nearness and conformity to the person of Jesus. It starts there. Focus on yourself being close to God and being like Jesus. Second, you have to change your mind. You have to set your perspective to see things like Jesus. You have to temper your expectations. If your spouse refuses to be like Jesus, Treat them like Jesus treats us when we fail to live like him. I got a few practicals here, okay? How, how are we going to change our minds? How do we do that? First, you need to expect failure. Expect failure from your spouse. That means accept your situation. It just is what it is. Yeah, they should repent. We know that, but they're not repenting. And so you're really going to frustrate yourself if every morning you're, you're begging, God, please change them, change them, change them. It's like they may change, they may not change, but you can change yourself to be someone who can endure the chaos. If you're not accepting your situation, you're fighting it. You're complaining about it. You're discontent. We have to decide to accept the thorn in our flesh and then rejoice that God's grace is strong enough to help us overcome it with joy. Again, this is a hard teaching. Second, I know these aren't in the notes. I'm sorry. Um, I can send them out to you or something. But second, when you accept your situation, you can then decide to be merciful and compassionate because you recognize that your partner's sin isn't a personal slight to you, but it is a loss to their own struggle with the homewrecker. My wife heard this quote. It's about parenting, but I think it applies in marriage as well. They are not giving you a hard time. They are having a hard time. As long as they are not leaning on Jesus, they will always be harassed and helpless. So you need to practice Romans 12. As far as it depends on you, live at peace. Overcome evil with good. Also, number three, you need to practice Philippians 4. That means even in the chaos, rejoice in the Lord always. Let your gentleness be evident to everyone. Let God's presence 
convict you, remember that he is near. Overcome your stress and anxiety with prayer and gratitude. Fill your thoughts always with the attributes of Jesus. And when you do those things, guys, you will experience the peace of God, which is able to shine even in the worst circumstances. That's why it says, peace that passes understanding. It makes no sense that someone can be in a hard marriage, yet still rejoice in Jesus and be joyful. It does make sense if they are leaning on the power of the peace of Jesus. You'd be surprised how much your spouse will change when you think differently about them. And they might not actually change at all, but your perception of them will be formed more by Jesus than by your bitterness. Some of you think you're in a bad marriage. Sorry. Some of you, yeah, sorry. Some of you think you're in a bad marriage uh, because you think poorly of your spouse. But if you decided to think positively or gracefully about them for a month, I guarantee your marriage would change. The home wrecker can never overcome a person transformed by the renewing of their mind. What are the ways that you can overcome the home wrecker today? In two weeks, we'll have the last sermon in this home wrecker series. It will be talking about the whole family and how the demon goes after more than just our marriages, but our children as well. But this morning, as we close out, let us meditate on Christ's love for us, exemplified through the cross, and how he gives us marriage so that we can understand that love. In Ephesians 5, 29, I'm going to close out here. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Let's pray now for the bread and the cup. Father God, thank you so much for the privilege of marriage. Even if it's a hard one, God, I pray that we can recognize we have the gift so that you can be glorified and so that we can know your love, practice your love, and we can help the world know and practice your love as well. And when things get hard, let us remember your son who allowed himself to die and be crucified for our sake so that we could be washed by his blood and made new. We love you so much. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.